Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Be Ye Holy Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Well, friends, I, it is such a blessing to be back with you, and I trust that you are blessed and walking with Jesus day by day. I trust that you're spending much time in his word. I trust that you're walking in the spirit and denying the flesh. Well, we're continuing our study in the book, Love Not the World with Watchman Nee, and today we're going to pick up in chapter three. Now, before we begin, I want to point out that the early part of this chapter is devoted to a theme or a topic that I struggle with. I'm not going to say that I disagree with it, but I'm going to say that I disagree with it. Now, I know that that sounds like a contradiction of sorts, and it may be, but let me point out just a couple of things. First of all, if baptism is necessary for salvation, which the author is going to claim, then works are necessary for salvation. Now, we know from the book of Ephesians that no man is saved by works. It is by faith alone in the Lord Jesus that salvation, regeneration is imparted to us. That is where we are born again, as Jesus said in John chapter 3. Now the problem with this, the text is taken from Mark chapter 16 and verse 16. And so if you were to open your Bible, for instance, and you turn to Mark, chapter 16, and you look, you're going to notice that 16 through 20 are the final verses of the chapter. Now, there are many Bible scholars and Bible theologians who argue that 16 through 20 is not in the original text, the Greek parchments. The, the book actually ends at verse 15, which means that this was later added. Now, if that is the case, and I say if because I do not know this to be true, I don't read Greek. But if this is the case, then the argument cannot stand because there's not another place that it specifically says it as it does in Mark anywhere else in the New Testament. So this verse is standalone. Now, if those who are skilled and biblical scholars and theologians tell us that these verses 16 through 20 are not in the original text, that the text actually ends at verse 15, then everything that's going to be discussed very early on in the chapter we're going to read today by Watchman Nee is unsubstantiated from the scriptures, and therefore we really don't need to give much credence to it. Now, I thought about just skipping this all together in the chapter and picking up where he ends this discussion, but that would be unfair to you because I want to give you the complete book as it is, and then you determine what it is that you believe. So with that being said, let's pick up in chapter three, which is titled A World Underwater in the book Love Not the World by Watchman Nee. Now, he begins with the text out of uh, Mark 16, verse 15 and 16. And it's the end of this verse that is in question with Bible scholars and theologians. Now, Jesus says, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. That's where the book actually ends, according to biblical scholars. But then he says, in verse 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that disbelieveth shall be condemned. Now to many of us, the form of that second sentence comes as a surprise. Jesus did not say that he who believes and is saved shall be baptized. No, he put it the other way around, if he actually said it. This is an assertion by me, Pastor Don. If he actually said it, he put it the other way around. Go well, back to watch Manee. He who believes and is baptized, Jesus said, shall be saved. It is only at our peril that we change something that the Lord has said into something that he did not say. Everything he says matters. 
and he means every word of it. But if this is so, then it must be a fact that only by having faith in him and being baptized are we saved. Again, I can't help but interject here, friends. Do you see a problem with that? Listen to his statement again. If this is so, if these are truly the words of Jesus, then it must be a fact that only by having faith in him and, notice that and, there's, a, there's another way or another means of salvation. Having faith in Jesus and being baptized, are we saved? Now some will puzzle at this, says Watchman Nee. What do you mean? They will protest. But do not puzzle, and do not blame me. I did not say it. My Lord said it. He it was who laid down the order. Faith, then baptism, then salvation. Friends, that goes against everything anywhere else in the Bible. This verse is a standalone. This sentence is a standalone outside of the rest of Scripture. Surely Jesus did not say this because he would have contradicted himself in other parts of the word of God. Now Watchman continues, we must not reverse it to faith. Salvation, then baptism, however much we might prefer it that way. What the Lord said must stand, and it is for us only to pay heed to it. Now I make no apology for taking these words of Mark 16:16. 16, 16, as authentic words of Jesus, says Watchman Nee. Though I am aware that there are critics who question them. Once in a country village, I came across a tailor named Chin. He had picked up a gospel of Mark. And when he reached this passage, which the critics all affirm does not belong to the gospel at all, he believed and trusted in the Lord. There were no other Christians in the place, and so no one there to baptize him. Well, what should he do? Then he read verse 20. God would confirm to him his word. That was sufficient for him. So in his simplicity, he decided to test out one of the promises in verse 18. Accordingly, he visited several neighbors who were sick. After prayer, he laid hands on them in Jesus' name and then returned home. In due course and without exception, he told me, they recovered. That satisfied him. With his faith confirmed, he carried quietly on with his tailoring, where when I came across him, he was faithfully witnessing for his Lord. If he could take God's word seriously, must not I? Now again, because this is so controversial, and it could be so confusing because of the position that the author is taking, I must interject that this example has nothing to do with anything because there are other places in scripture for instance James chapter 5 that says if we lay hands on the sick they will recover that God hears the prayers of his saints that God will act on their behalf that when faith is exercised a miracle can be seen and so just because God worked on behalf of this tailor doesn't necessarily mean that he was confirming verses 16 to verse 20 as being the, the authentic word of God. Well, Watchman continues, So I repeat, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So you mean to tell me you will now exclaim that you believe in baptismal regeneration? No, indeed I do not. The Lord did not say, believe and be baptized, and thou shalt be born again. And since he did not say that, I have no need to believe in that. Now again, you, you have to see a contradiction here. Regeneration and salvation and being born again are all the same thing, just different terms to identify what it means to be born into the Spirit and to become dead to the flesh and the things of this world. That's what salvation is. A new desire to love God and a new desire to hate ourselves. Where at one time we loved ourselves and we hated God. And so for him to say that he does not believe in baptismal regeneration, but he does believe in baptismal salvation, baptismal salvation and baptismal regeneration are the same things, friends. 
Well, he continues and says, the Lord's words are, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. What therefore I do believe in is baptismal salvation. So the question naturally arises, what does this statement mean? And what does it mean when Luke tells us that in response to Peter's exhortation to save yourselves from this crooked generation, which we read in Acts 2.40, then they that received his words were baptized. To answer this, we must ask ourselves first, what we mean by the word saved. I am afraid that most of us have a very wrong idea of salvation. All that most of us know about salvation is that we shall be saved from hell and into heaven. Or alternatively, that we are saved from our sins to live henceforth a holy life. But we are wrong. In scripture, we find that salvation goes further than that. For it is concerned not so much with sin and hell or holiness in heaven, but with something else. We know that every good gift that God offers to us is given to meet and counter a contrasting evil. He gives us justification because there is condemnation. He gives us eternal life because there is eternal death. He offers us forgiveness because there are sins. So he brings us salvation because of what? Justification is in terms of condemnation. Heaven is in terms of hell. Forgiveness is in relation to sin. Well then, to what is salvation related? Salvation, we shall see, is related to the cosmos, the world as we have discussed in the first two chapters. Satan is the personal enemy of Christ. He works through the flesh of man to produce this pattern of things on the earth in which we have all become involved. Not one of us is exempt. And this whole cosmic pattern is peculiarly at odds with God the Father. I think we all know how the three dark forces work. The world, the flesh, and the devil. They all stand in opposition to the three divine persons. The flesh is ranged against the Holy Spirit as paraclete. Satan himself stands against Christ Jesus as Lord, and the world stands against the Father as Creator. What we are speaking of as the cosmos always stands opposed to God as Father and Originator. His was the eternal plan in creation hinted at in the words, it was very good. A plan toward which he has not ceased to work. From before the foundation of the world, he had purposed in his heart to have on earth an order of which mankind would be the pinnacle and which should freely display the character of his son Jesus. But Satan intervened. Using this earth as his springboard and man as his tool, he usurped God's creation to make of it instead something centered in himself and reflecting his own image. Thus, this alien system of things was a direct challenge to the divine plan. So today we are confronted by two worlds, two spheres of authority having two totally different and opposed characters. For me now, it is no mere matter of a future heaven and hell. It is a question of these two worlds today, and of whether I belong to an order of things of which Christ is sovereign Lord, or to an opposed order of things having Satan as its effective head. Thus, Salvation is not so much a personal question of sins forgiven or of hell avoided. It is to be seen rather in terms of a system from which we come out. When we are saved, we make our exodus out of one world and our entry into another. We are saved now out of that whole organized realm which Satan has constructed in defiance of the purpose of God. 
that realm, that all-embracing cosmos, has many strange facets. Sin, of course, has its prior place there, and worldly lust. But no less part of it are our more estimable human standards and ways of doing things. The human mind, its culture, and its philosophies all are included, together with all the very best of humanity's social and political ideologies. Alongside these two, we should doubtless place the world's religions, and among them, those speckled birds worldly Christianity, and its world church. Wherever the power of natural man dominates, there you have an element in that system which is under the direct inspiration of Satan. Let me read that again. Wherever the power of natural man dominates, there you have an element in that system which is under the direct inspiration of Satan. If that is the world, what then is salvation? Salvation means that I escape from that. I go out. I make an exit from that all-embracing cosmos. I belong no more to Satan's pattern of things. I set my heart on that which God's heart is set. I take as my goal his eternal purpose in Christ. And I step into that and am delivered from this. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. What Jesus is saying, and again I must interject if he actually said it, would plainly mean I take that step of faith. I believe and therefore I am baptized. And I come out a saved man. That is salvation. So never let us regard baptism as of small concern, says Watchman Nee. Tremendous things hang upon it. It is no less a question than of two violently opposing worlds and of our translation from the one into the other. Now there is in scripture another passage which brings baptism and salvation together to illustrate this theme. I allude to chapter 3 of 1 Peter. There the apostle tells us, how the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. The water, he says, is a figure or likeness or an antitype of something else, which also in the antitype doth now save you, even baptism. So baptism, he reasons, saves us now. Clearly, Peter believed in our salvation through baptism as firmly as he believed in Noah's salvation through water. Again, an interjection. If baptism is so important, why didn't Jesus do it? Why didn't Paul do it? We're never told Jesus baptized anyone, and we're told in Scripture that Paul only baptized four or five. So if a person's eternal entrance was based upon a work such as baptism, wouldn't it been not a priority both for Jesus and for Paul? Again, friends, I know how controversial and debatable this issue can be. I merely want you to consider all sides, all questions, so that you can see the problem with stating that baptism is necessary for one's salvation. Well, back to Watchman Nee. Please remember, I am not saying regeneration, and I am not saying deliverance from hell or from sin. Understand clearly that we are talking here about salvation. It is not just a question of terms. It concerns our being fundamentally severed from today's world system. And although it seems Watchman Nee is hammering in this point, that salvation is based upon this world in which we live, salvation ultimately is being spared the wrath of God upon the sin of mankind and the sin of this world. And so I would agree with, with Watchman Nee that salvation is deliverance from the world in which we live, but it's also two sides of the same coin. So we can't say that salvation is all now and not 
something to take place in the future. And we can't say that it's something to take place in the future only, disregarding the here and now. It's both, friends. I trust that you can see that from Scripture. Well, Watchman continues, To understand better what Peter means, we should turn back to his source in chapter 6 to 8 of Genesis. Now, the picture is instructive. There in Noah's day, we find a wholly corrupt world. Created first by God, the earth had become corrupted by man's act on that day when he placed himself under Satan. Sin, once introduced, had developed and run riot until even God's Holy Spirit cried, Enough! Things had reached a state where they could never be remedied. They could only be judged and removed. So God commanded Noah to build an ark and to bring his family and the creatures into it. And then the flood came. By it, they were lifted up above the earth, the Bible says, upon the waters that covered all the high mountains that are under the whole heaven. You'll find this in Genesis 7, verse 19. Every living thing, both man and beast, perished, and only those who rode the waters in the ark were saved. The significant thing here is not just that they escaped death by drowning. That is not the point. The real point for us is that they were the only people to come out from that corrupt system of things, that world underwater. Personal life is the inevitable consequence of coming out. Personal perdition of staying in. But salvation is the coming out itself, not the effect of it. Note this difference, for it is a great one. Salvation is essentially a present exit from a doomed order which is Satan's. Praise God they came out. And how did they come out? Through the waters. So today when believers are baptized, they go symbolically through water, just as Noah passed in the ark through the waters of the flood. And this passage through water signifies their escape from the world, their exodus from the system of things that, with its prince, is under divine sentence. May I say this especially to those who are being baptized today. Please remember, you are not the only one who is in the water. As you step down into the water, a whole world goes down with you. When you come up, you come up in Christ, in the ark that rides the waves. But your world stays behind. For you, that world is submerged, drowned like Noah's, put to death in the death of Christ, and never to be revived. It is by baptism that you declare, Lord, I leave my world behind. Thy cross separates me from it forever. Speaking figuratively, therefore, when you go through the waters of baptism, Everything belonging to the former system is cut off by those waters, never to return. You alone emerge. Now let me pose another question here, and let me begin by saying that the word baptism comes from the Greek word baptizo, which means to submerge. So it's clear in the fact that sprinkling isn't, isn't what it's, it's talking about being submerged. When we are told to be baptized in Jesus... Could it be, now this is a question, could it be that we are being told that we need to physically go through a baptism of water? Or does it simply mean that we are to be submerged in the Lord Jesus? We are to be soaking wet in Jesus. He is to cover every inch of our body. He is to become our whole person. I tend to believe that's what the scripture is discussing, and that would go in line of being a work of faith and a result of our regeneration, our being born again in the spirit, being welcomed into the kingdom of God. Watchman continues, for you, it is a passage into another realm, a world where you will find a dove and the fresh leaves of olive trees. You go out of the world that is under judgment and into a world that is marked by newness of divine life. 
I want to emphasize again that you were not the only one who went down into the water. Your world went down with you, and there it stayed. From the standpoint of your new situation, you will find that the water always covers the world to which you belonged before. The same flood which saved Noah and his family drowned the world in which they had once lived their lives. The very same flood. So the same water, on the one hand, puts you and me on salvation ground in Christ. And on the other hand, buries Satan's whole system of things. Not only does your own history as a child of Adam end in your baptism or your submersion in Jesus, I would interject, your world also ends there. In both cases, it is a death and a burial with nothing resurrected. It is an end of everything. This means that you cannot carry over anything from that former world into the new one. Let me read that again. Because this is clear black and white, and here I agree with the author wholeheartedly. The Bible is very black and white on this issue. We cannot carry anything over from the former world into the new one. Any habit, any forms of speech, any practices, any attitudes, everything's changed. What once was alive is now dead, and what was once dead is now alive. That's what 2 Corinthians 5.17 means. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. All things are now become new. Well, back to our author. This means that you cannot carry over anything from that former world into the new one. What belonged to that former realm of things in Adam stays there and may never be recalled. Formerly, perhaps you were an employee in a shop or a servant in a house, or perhaps you were the master or the manager or director of a business. Still today, you may be a master or a servant, but you will find that when coming to divine themes, when coming to the church of God and the service of God, there is neither bond nor free, neither employee nor employer. Again, you may be a Jew or a Gentile, or any of a hundred and one things that were of repute, or of disrepute, in Adam. When you pass through this water, all that system of things goes, never to return. Instead, you see yourself in Christ, where there is neither Jew nor Greek, barbarian nor Scythian, nor anything else but one new man. You have entered an order of things characterized by olive trees and olive leaves, whose secret is divine life. The expression through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is found in 1 Peter 3.21, colors the whole future. It implies that you have passed into something altogether new, which God is creating. According to commentators, for instance, Robert Young in his Analytical Concordance of the Holy Bible, the very name Ararat means holy ground. And Ararat, for those of you that may not know, is the mountain on which the ark ultimately rested after the floodwaters had receded. And so Watchman Nee is saying here that commentators tell us that Ararat, the Hebrew word, actually means holy ground. Well, be that as it may, we praise God that the ark which rested on that renewed earth was filled with creatures, typifying a new creation. Out of the death of Christ, God brings into being an entire new creation. And in union with Christ risen, he is introducing man into that. In Christ, you and I are there. Now, before we continue, let me pose another question, if I may, and please forgive me if, if this is bothersome to you. But again, I, I want you to consider all things. Nicodemus approached Jesus and asked Jesus what he must do to enter into heaven. And Jesus merely said, you must be born again. 
He didn't say you must be born again and baptized. He said you must be born again. That was his condition for Nicodemus. And as far as we know, that's all that Nicodemus did, was trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, and therefore he became a new creation. There's no indication in Scripture that Nicodemus was ever baptized. Well, back to the book. You ask me now whether it matters if we are baptized. My only answer is that the Lord himself commanded it in the text in which we've read. And it was a step from which he himself refused to be dissuaded. Peter describes baptism as the apparel or testimony of a good conscience towards God. But is Peter discussing being submerged in water or being submerged in the Lord Jesus? Again, I pose that question. A testimony is a declaration, says Watchman Nee. So through this act, you say something. You declare where you stand, perhaps without using words, but certainly by what you do. Passing through the water, you proclaim it to the whole universe that you have left your world behind and have entered into something utterly new. That is salvation. You take a public stand that God has placed you in Christ. And to that, I will agree, but it's not necessary for salvation. A testimony is not necessary for salvation. And walking to the altar is not necessary for salvation. But all of those could be a witness to the outside world that you now deny yourself, you deny the world in which you live, and you stand for Jesus. There's many ways to do that not just through being baptized in water. Well, back to the author. This helps to explain why in Scripture we find passages concerning salvation which are hard to interpret if we relate salvation only to hell or to sin. It illumines, for instance, the apparently difficult words of Paul and Silas to the jailer at Philippi. The man asked, What must I do to be saved? What will your answer be? If you are a sound evangelical preacher in the present day, you will say, believe on the Lord Jesus and thou shalt be saved. But Paul, in fact, added, thou and thy house. Now, do you really mean to say that if I believe on the Lord Jesus, both I and my family will be saved? Now, once again, we must be careful. Paul did not say, believe on the Lord Jesus, and thou and thy house will have eternal life. He said, believe on the Lord Jesus, and thou shalt be saved, thou and thy house. Now, Watchman Nee is referencing Acts chapter 16, beginning around verse 30. And it says, the Philippi jailer brought Paul and Silas out of the prison and said to them, what must I do to be saved? Now, I point this out. This is very important. Verse 31, Paul says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, thy and thy house. But now look at verse 34. It says, when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and he rejoiced. Notice this, believing in God with all his house. The reason his whole house was saved is because everyone in the house believed as well. So again, Watchman Nee's argument here does not hold water because he's not keeping the true text in mind when forming his opinion. Well, he continues, remember, Paul is concerned with a system of things and with the jailer's repudiation of and exit from that system. When, as head of his family, that man makes the declaration that from that day forward, he and his house are going to serve the Lord, and when that declaration becomes publicly known, even people passing through the street will point in the door and say they are Christian folk. But the house isn't Christian based upon the belief of one man. As we just read in the actual story, the reason that the house is saved is because everyone in the house believed on the Lord Jesus. Well, Watchman Nee continues, that is what it means to be saved. You declare that you belong to another system of things. People point to you and say, oh yes, 
That is a Christian family. They belong to the Lord. Now that is the salvation which the Lord desires for you and me. That by our public testimony, we declare before God, my world has gone, I am entering into another. May the Lord give us that kind of salvation. To find ourselves uprooted entirely out of the old doomed order of things and firmly planted in the new divine one. For praise God, there is a glorious positive side to all this. We are saved through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who Peter goes on to say is on the right hand of God. Having gone into heaven, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. 1 Peter 3.22 God has set his son supreme above everything and has made all authorities his subjects. A God who can do this is well able to bring me and you, body and soul, into that other realm. So to recapitulate, we have here two worlds. On the one hand, there is the world in Adam, held fast in bondage to Satan. On the other hand, there is the new creation in Christ, the sphere of activity of God's Holy Spirit. How do you and I get out of the one sphere, Adam, and into the other sphere, Christ? If you are uncertain how to answer that question, may I ask you another? How did you get into Adam in the first place? For the way of entry indicates the way out. You entered the sphere of Adam by being born into Adam's race. How then do you get out? Obviously by death. And how in turn do you enter the sphere of Christ? The answer is the same, by birth. The way of entry into the family of God is by new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Having become united with him by the likeness of his death, you are united with him also by the likeness of his resurrection. This is what is discussed in Romans chapter 6, specifically verse 5. Death puts an end to your relationship with the old world, and resurrection brings you into living touch with the new world, God's world, the world of the Spirit. Finally, what occupies the gap between the worlds? What is the stepping stone between those two worlds? Is it not burial? We were buried, therefore, with him through baptism into death, the Bible tells us. From one point of view, there is a grim finality about those words, buried into death. My history in Adam has already been concluded in the death of Christ, so that when I walk away from that burial, I can say that I am a finished man. But I can say more, for praise God, it is no less true that there is the other side. Since Christ was raised from the dead, when I come out of the water and walk away, I may now walk in newness of life. That's what we're told in Romans 6, 4. This double outcome of the cross is implied as well in the preceding words which are found in Romans 6, 3. Are you ignorant that all we who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Here in a single sentence, the two aspects of baptism are again hinted at. Yes, but the question is, is it baptism in water or baptism in Jesus? You see, we're being told that we're to be baptized or submerged in Jesus, not baptized or submerged by water. Well, Watchman continues, this fact that we are baptized into Jesus' death or submerged into Jesus' death is a tremendous fact. But is it all? Not by any means. For in the second place, the same verse says that we were baptized into Christ Jesus. A baptism into the death of Christ ends my relationship with this world. But a baptism into Christ Jesus as a living person, head of a new race, opens up for me a new world of things altogether. And so does it for you, friend. 
Going into the water, he says, I simply act the whole thing out, affirming publicly that the judgment of this world became real to me from the day when the lifted up Son of Man drew me to himself. What a gospel to preach to the whole creation. And that brings us to the end of chapter 3 today, friends. And I just want to apologize for interjecting so often. You know if you've listened to my other readings that I, I, I refuse to interject. But because this is so controversial, so confusing, I don't want you, first of all, to think that it is our position in this ministry to agree with what Watchman Nee says here. Because I certainly don't. But I don't want you to hear only one side of the presentation either. I want you to hear all sides of the presentation. I want you to consider all questions so that you can form an opinion for yourself. If you are confused at this point, I deeply apologize. I would encourage you to go back and listen to this again. Because in listening to it again, you can pay closer attention. And you can revert to certain passages of scripture and you can allow the word of God to speak for itself. Jesus said, faith and faith alone is required. It is not by works because if it were by works, we would then have something to boast about. And there are many who boast that they have been baptized and yet they have not been submerged in the Lord Jesus. And I can assure you, friends, there are many who have been submerged in the Lord Jesus and have never been baptized and will spend eternity with us, with the Lord Jesus, in the fellowship of his Father and his Holy Spirit. Well, as he wills, and until next time, friends, I truly love you. I'm so glad again that you're with us, and I pray the Word of God is having a direct impact and a direct influence in your life. Now, as he wills, and until next time, may the Lord Jesus bless your walk, and I'll see you on the next video.